Good evening, everyone. My name is Jewel James. I am a first year Master in Public Policy student here at the Kenny School of Government. And I welcome you to tonight's keynote address to kick off our Public Policy and Leadership Conference. The goal of the PPLC, as we call it, is to increase the representation of minorities in graduate public policy programs and in careers in public service. We have selected 50 outstanding young people to participate in this year's conference from a fairly competitive applicant pool. They have flown in today from cities across the country, and I would like for us to all welcome them on behalf of the King School of Government. Can we have this year's applicants uh, or participants please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Before I introduce this evening's moderator, I would like to recognize the other two PPLC coordinators, Han Nugan and Yahweh Ye, for all of their hard work in putting together this year's conference. And on behalf of Yahweh, Han, myself, I want to express our deepest gratitude to Dean McCarthy and the entire admissions staff, especially Alexandra Martinez, Director of Admissions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Professor Nolan Bowie, who will in turn introduce our keynote speaker this evening, the Honorable Elijah Cummings. Professor Nolan Bowie is a senior fellow and adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government. He is affiliated with the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy, the Center for Business and Government, and, work, and with the Berkman Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. From 1986 to 1998, Professor Bowie was an Associate Professor of Communications at the School of Communications and Theater at Temple University. Professor Bowie is a former staff attorney and executive director of Citizens Communication Center, a public interest law firm and education institution. He has served both as Assistant Special Prosecutor with the Watergate Special Prosecution Force and Assistant Attorney General, Civil Rights Bureau, New York State Department of Law. He writes, lectures, and teaches about new information, media policies, regulations, and issues of public policy concerning the emerging information society. He is an advocate for social, political, and economic equity, equality, fairness, and justice, and in 2001 was presented the Award for Excellence in Teaching at the Kennedy School of Government. Everyone, please welcome Professor Nolan Bowie. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Kennedy School. Um, it is indeed my pleasure and a sincere honor to uh, introduce tonight's guest speaker, the Honorable Elijah E. Cummings, member of the United States House of Representatives, representing Maryland's 7th District, located in the city of Baltimore. Congressman Cummings is now serving in his sixth term. He is the immediate past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and is currently serving on the House Government Reform Committee. In addition, Congressman Cummings is the ranking member of the Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources Subcommittee, as well as a member of the Federal Workforce and Agency Organization Subcommittee. And if you ever thought that being a member of Congress was a piece of cake, like, for example, being a university professor, then you should check out Congressman Cummings' committee assignments from the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee to the co-chair of the House AIDS Working Group and House Task Force on Healthcare Reform. Congressman Cummings was born January 18, 1951. He graduated with honors from Baltimore City College High School in 1969. He then attended Howard University, graduating Phi Beta Kappa in 1963 with a degree in political science. While in college, he held several elective offices, including service as sophomore class president, student government treasurer, student uh, government president, all examples of early leadership experience. In 1976, he earned a Juris Doctorate degree from the University of Maryland School of Law. He has had a distinguished career as an attorney and served on the Maryland House of Delegates for 16 years before being elected to Congress. 
I could go on mentioning the numerous nonprofit and service boards he has served on, but then Kennedy School students as well as undergraduate students who've already been recognized for their scholarship and leadership already know how to pull information from the internet and other sources. I would only suggest that um, you uh, should go to, if you want to keep up with Congress, Congressman Cummings' thoughts and on current issues of public policy and law, you should download uh, the bi-weekly bi columns that he writes for the Baltimore African American newspaper. I've been doing this uh, in order to prepare for the, these remarks, and uh, what I discovered was a very astute, diligent, observant, analytical, and fair legislator and policy wonk who works on behalf not just of special interest, but on behalf of the interest of all Americans. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Congressman Elijah Cummings. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Come on, we can do better than that. Good, morning. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I had to get up at 4.30 this morning to be here, coming from Phoenix. And so it's indeed my honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Professor Nolan Bowie for his very kind introduction. It's, uh, you know, Professor, I, uh, I do a lot of writing. Sometimes you wonder who reads it. But I'm glad to know you do. Thank you. Um, and certainly to Jewel James, who is now here at Harvard. Uh, the thing she didn't say is that she used to, when I was uh, chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, she was our special projects coordinator and did an outstanding job. And uh, I am so happy for her. Uh, and I know she, uh, I've often told her that I'm just excited about all the appointments with success that I know are in front of her. And I want to thank you, Joel, for uh, inviting me and opening up uh, the doors to, for me to be here. Also want to thank uh, Dean uh, Elwood, David Elwood, uh, for your leadership. It's certainly good to be with you. I want to thank you for all that you do. But most important of all, I want to thank all of you for taking out a moment of your time to be here with me. It's so interesting as I listen to Professor Bowie and as he talked about um, my writings and my theories and policy uh, positions, the thing that I guess a lot of people don't realize is that I am one who is truly blessed. Um, so that you can understand who's talking to you. I want you to understand that my mother and father only had a first grade education. They were sharecroppers from Manning, South Carolina. They came to Baltimore in 1945 to make a better life for themselves and their seven children to be. And they college educated all seven of us. The interesting thing about my life is that I was placed in special ed in the kindergarten. They uh, told me they put me in special ed professor because uh, they said I talked too much. <laughs> little did they know that the same little boy that they put in special ed and left him there for several years would grow up to be not only a Phi Beta Kappa, but a member of the Congress of the United States of America. And so because of that, much of what I do in my public life is done with a certain level of passion because I also realize that I am blessed to be where I am and I never forget that there are so many other little African American boys and girls, Hispanics and many others, who have been placed in situations where they never, never will get a chance to fulfill even a portion of their dreams. And so I feel blessed. I told, uh, I just left a conference with um, 75 ministers, African American ministers, average congregation 7,000 people. 
including T.D. Jakes. And we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that we've got to find ways to take their theology, combine it with sociology, to make policy. And so tonight, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk to you very briefly about some points that they asked me to talk about, and, and then I want to hear your questions. You know, we can't entirely foresee what the future will bring, but some of the important implications are clear. As my good friend, former President Clinton, often reminds us, we must engage the rest of the world in a new relationship of shared benefits and shared responsibilities. And I am convinced that President Clinton's insight applies with equal validity to our domestic policies and relationships as well. If we are to remain the leading nation in the world, we must retain the economic and the social vision that will retain the loyalty and motivate the ingenuity of all Americans. And I emphasize all. Thank you. <laughs> we must fortify the democratic values that are so essential to the respect that we need from the rest of the world. On these points, most policymakers agree. And although we may disagree politically as to the specifics of what we must change and what we must retain, leaders of both major political parties understand that it will be you, rather than me, who will write the next chapter of America's story. And one of the reasons why I love coming to speak to young audiences like you is because I realize that you are the living messages we send to a future we will never see. And my future is in your hands. And I also understand something else that's very, very important, is that you have something that I don't have. Yeah, I'm a Phi Beta Kappa, I'm a father, ran a law practice, member of Congress, but you have something that I don't have. At 55 years old, my life, I've now lived more than I will live. Your lives are in front of you. And so it's very important that you, as possible policymakers of the future, understand the responsibility that you have. One of our most important duties is to prepare you to defend what is best about America, even while you oversee those aspects of our society that must submit to the requirements of change. That is why I stand before this forum with a clear understanding that America must make full use of all our people and especially of our most talented young people if we are to prevail in this increasingly difficult world. These are the overriding imperatives of our time. America must change. We must become most, both more productive and more fair to our people, while we also fortify, defend, and expand the democratic values that have made this great nation. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot ex export democracy when we're not doing democracy here at home. Now, as most of you no doubt are aware, February has come to be known as Black History Month. I'm going to briefly touch upon some of that history during these remarks, but please remember that my reason for traveling here to Harvard has far more to do with the future than it does with the past. In this vein, I note that our organizers have entitled the forum Pursuing the Dream, Black Empowerment Post-Civil Rights. It's true, of course, that we have been noting the anniversaries of some of the most significant advances in civil rights during the last century the Brown decision, as well as the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And with the recent funeral of Coretta Scott King, I can understand how some might find it significant that some of the most important leaders in that, of that progressive era have now passed into history. Nevertheless, I must respectfully submit to you that it is not entirely accurate to speak of the civil rights movement in the past tense. 
From my perspective, at least, the civil rights era of our time has just begun. I mentioned the Brown versus Board case because it is a very significant one. Jewel Daines was present, I think, not very long ago when we celebrated the 50th anniversary. And we recall a young lady who got up in the audience. She was only maybe 10, 11 years old. And I shall never forget it as long as I live. It is embedded in the DNA of every cell of my brain. Here was this little girl speaking to the Congress of the United States about Brown versus Board. And she got up and she said, I, my name is Kayla. I go to the John P. Sousa School. And she said, 50 years ago, I've seen the pictures. My school was segregated. And she said, it was all white. A little 11 year old. She said, today, my school is still segregated. It's all black. She said, in my school, 50 years ago, they had a beautiful library with books on all the shelves. She said, today, there are no books on the shelves in my library, and there's no librarian because the adults told us that they cannot afford a librarian. She said, I rush home from school every day. I have to get home as fast as I can. She said, I go home every day as fast as I can because in my school, understand she's talking about 50 years after Brown versus Board. She said, I can't go to the bathroom because the bathroom smells so bad and the doors are off of the hinges and I cannot go there. So I have to rush home or, or I may have an accident on myself. And she said, she, she said to us, she said, I, I'm telling you, this is my chance. This is my chance to get an education. You've had your chance, adults. Give me my chance. And she said, I just want to grow up and be somebody. And so when we talk about civil rights and we talk about the past tense of civil rights, ladies and gentlemen, Brown may have happened 50 years ago, but quiet is kept. It may be a little bit different in here in Cambridge or in Boston, but in Baltimore and cities all over this country, we still have a separate and unequal school system. You may not want to hear it, but it's the truth. And unequal. And so I believe in a civil rights movement that will address the critical issues such as education that were left unresolved during the 1960s. What are those unresolved civil rights issues? Well, we are a democratic republic. And the assurance that every vote will be counted is essential to the continuing legitimacy of our government. And understand the issue of voting is not a black or white issue. It is a red, white, and blue issue. The very essence of our de democracy is about one person's ability, whether he be the president of, of a major corporation or whether he be the janitor that will sweep up this building tonight. The one day when he is equal, when those two people are equal are on election day and then we deprive one person of their right to vote, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking apart this wonderful thing we call a democracy. The that right of every American to have a voice in establishing governmental policy must, have, must also have relevance in the daily lives of our people. As my dear and departed friend, the late Senator Paul Wellstone, was always quick to remind us, he says, Americans yearn for politics of the center, a politics that speaks to the critical issues that are at the center of their daily lives. You know that those centers, you know what those centrist issues are. After all, you are in the process of becoming experts in public policy. And then there's some of you who are thinking about becoming experts in public policy. In my view, the central challenges of, of our time include creating 
universally affordable education of the highest quality, doors to opportunity that will extend through college to graduate study, establishing universal and affordable health care for every American. And let's go back to that uh, issue of college education. In the state of Maryland, college tuition has gone up some 35 percent, 35 percent, approaching 50 over the last few years. And we have young people like Kayla who, if she's able to, to get through that system, not by pulling herself up by her boots or her bootstraps because she doesn't have the boots and don't have the straps, but if she does make it, and then get to the door of a university, and a university wants to accept her, you've got a situation where she can't even get the tuition to go. And not only does she, can't she get the tuition to go, she's got a, uh, a Congress that says we're going to make it harder for her mother to borrow the money, even if her mother could borrow it. This is America. This is America. This is a country who gained its moral authority by the fact that, in part, by the fact that it constantly takes care of its own. And so the other challenges that we have are transforming our national economy into an engine in which success is measured by the creation of good jobs that pay a living wage and offer a decent retirement for all Americans who are willing and able to work. Don't tell me about an increase in jobs when, it cre and when he, and, and if there are new jobs coming on online, there are jobs that pay less than the jobs before and lack the benefits that job that we had before in jobs. There's something wrong with that picture. We need to be about assuring that our privacy, listen to me, assuring that our privacy and other civil liberties as citizens will not be violated by the government in which we place our trust. Developing public policies that reflect the reality that issues of environmental justice affect us all. And restoring America to a position of moral authority. These challenges, my friends, are at the core of the civil rights movement of our time. The present and the future tense popular movement to which I am devoting my adult life. In my mind, the civil rights movement of the 21st century has its beginning, as is in, in, has its enduring symbol. The, uh, in my mind, the civil rights movement of the 21st century has as its enduring symbol that flag that still flies in my city of Baltimore. These are the goals to which I rededicate myself every time that I see the flag. And every time I go to an assembly and watch those little children put their hands up to their hearts and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. We are now going through a difficult and dangerous time, a time in which many Americans would have us retreat, retreat into the past. We must understand that our past, for that history, is the foundation upon which we must build. However, as I mentioned before, the winds of change are gripping the sails of our world. We must move forward. We cannot go backwards. These are indeed tough times. But I refuse to believe that the dream of America will be denied to you or to the generations of Americans yet unborn. I shall never forget just recently when I went to Disney World. Yeah, I do take time to go to Disney World. And on the Animal Kingdom, there's a sign that reads this. It says that it says our environment was not inherited from our parents. It has been borrowed from our children. But we can say the same thing about our democracy. We can say the same thing about the opportunities we have to get an education. We can say the same things about all of the freedoms that we have in this country, all of the freedoms that our soldiers are fighting and dying for in Iraq and Afghanistan. Those are the freedoms that we are talking about. Those are the advantages that we are talking about. And that's we, the freedoms that we are talking about are those that we are borrowing from our children. But let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, at the rate that we are going, you know, you usually think about borrowing something and paying back with interest. 
we will not even be able to pay back the principal. Forget the interest. And so as a father, I've dedicated my adult life to giving America's children the opportunities that I received when I was young. And I mean all of our children, every single one of them. The civil rights movement of this century, our century, is a continuing struggle for inclusion, social justice, and respect for all Americans, whatever their color may be. And it is for this civil rights movement that I have come here to Harvard. I've come here to come, I've come here simply to ask you to lead. There are so many people that come upon the world earth and they see so much wrong with the earth and then they say to themselves, I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just going to go along to get along. Although I have been equipped with a brilliant mind and been given wonderful opportunities, I just want to go along to get along. I simply want to be comfortable in my house with my two and a half kids, picket fence, and I just want to do well. Well, I have not come here to ask you to lead, I have come here to beg you. The challenges that I've noted to you this evening are not remnants of our past. Our success in meeting these challenges will define our future. For some, the politics of elective office may be no more than a succession of campaigns. But for me and for all of the other Americans who think like me, they are something far more enduring. We are an abiding movement, not a campaign for this moment. The vision of our evolving civil rights movement is an, is an ambitious one, nothing less than the reconstruction of America. I decided that it would be appropriate to examine this vision in the context of your conference, Black Empowerment, with a clear understanding of one essential fact. Americans of color will not be fully empowered in this country neither politically, economically, nor socially, unless and until all Americans are empowered, whatever may be the color of their skin. This is not to say that I have forsaken my support for affirmative action, anti-discrimination laws, or other partial mechanisms that we have developed in this society as a response to slavery and Jim Crow. Far from it. These mechanisms are as important as they ever have been. Nevertheless, we must face some harsh facts. And the first of those harsh facts is this. After four decades of civil rights initiatives, America remains in a state of de facto segregation. That is why the civil rights movement of our time must speak truth to power. That is why we must appeal to the conscience and self-interest of this great nation when we declare that we have not ended segregation when minority school children are less likely to receive an empowerment, empowering education uh, because America has not adequately funded all of our public schools. We have not eliminated segregation when Americans of color are redlined out of our dream home uh, opportunities of home ownership, racially profiled out of our right to justice and denied equal opportunity in the workplace and business. We have not elimin se eliminated segregation in America when men and women of color are more likely to die because of discriminatory health care system. We have not eliminated segregation in America when this nation fails to provide the financial support that would allow all of our children to complete college. And we will not end de facto segregation in America by nominating and confirming federal judges who believe incredibly that the civil rights war amendments of our Constitution prohibit voluntary action to more fully include minority Americans in the most empowering opportunities of our national life. All of this is the truth. If we are to meet the challenges of a changing world, we must be willing to openly discuss the implications of these truths about ourselves and must be willing to undertake corrective action. We must do this because nearly a century and a half after the Civil War, the reconstruction of America is far from complete. Consider our history for just a few moments. In the 19th century, Americans fought and died 
for the proposition that the freedom and economic opportunity of one person cannot be based on subjugation of another. Slavery was this nation's original sin. It was a fundamental wrong that Americans of conscience of every race and creed struggled with. The original strategy of Reconstruction was valid, but after a time, the country lost the political will to follow this strategy to its logical conclusion. Then there came the second wave of Reconstruction. This nation regressed into segregation and Jim Crow, and for generations, the high ideals of the 19th century Reconstruction went unfulfilled. Then Thurgood Marshall and others completed the legal strategy for a, a second wave of Reconstruction. When the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board that racially separate education is inherently unequal and unconstitutional, that ruling provided an essential foundation for America's second 20th century Reconstruction movement. We know the second wave of Reconstruction as the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. As we, we confront the challenges that we face today, we must never forget that the Brown victory did not happen overnight. To formulate the 20th century's Reconstruction of America, Thurgood Marshall and many other committed leaders struggled for decades, beginning in the 1930s. In 1935, Thurgood Marshall, Wi William Gosnell, and the NAACP legal director Charles Hamilton Houston challenged the University of Maryland's exclusion of black students in the circuit court for Baltimore City. In the case of Mary versus Pearson, they successfully argued that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment must be satisfied within Maryland, not by sending law students out of state, but, but, but by educating them in the state of Maryland. If you were to look right now at the older lawyers from the state of Maryland, African-American lawyers, most of them were educated at some Ivy League schools. They weren't educated in Maryland because they would have rather sent them out of the state, paid more money to send them out of the state to another school than to educate them in Maryland schools where their foreparents had paid their taxes and had lived. A 1990 Washington Post article by Juan Williams memorialized how my teacher and friend, Juanita Jackson Mitchell, assessed the impact of Marshall's 1935 legal victory. And I quote, the colored people of Baltimore were on fire then Thurgood, when Thurgood did that. They were euphoric with victory. We didn't know about the Constitution. He brought us the Constitution as a document like Moses brought his people the Ten Commandments, end of quote. And after I graduated from Howard in the early 1970s, I was able to attend the University of Maryland Law School because of what Thurgood Marshall and the NACP had accomplished. Understand, out of the 13 or 14 schools at the University of Maryland, the School of Social Work, of Dentistry, of Medicine, every single school had to go through a court case before they would integrate. Every single one of them. And the facts were almost identical for each case. Today, friends, as a result of that second 20th century wave of reconstruction, I have a far greater opportunity to serve this diverse nation. And many other Americans who look like me have the opportunity to learn and grow here at places like Harvard University. Today, because of what Marshall and his contemporaries accomplished, we have the largest African-American middle class in our history. And understand that Marshall and his, and, and his group of lawyers did not only make it better for African-American people, they made it better for many other people, and they also opened the doors of diversity so that we could understand each other better. But ladies and gentlemen, we are also painfully aware that all is not right in America, in this America of our time. The overriding vision of the civil rights movement of this century, my friends, is nothing less than the third wave of American Reconstruction. It is time for renewed and a multiracial movement that will empower not only the children of African Americans, but the children of all Americans. As I mentioned to you a few moments ago, our agenda must be one that speaks to the issues central to the lives of all Americans, freedom, opportunity, fairness, security, and health. 
I offer you this thesis that this nation remains in a state of de facto segregation. But if I am to speak truth to power this evening, I must do all that I can to speak the whole truth. And the whole truth includes this important reality. And I'm almost finished now. I see you getting nervous. It's all right. I got you. I got you. I got you. But I got to say what I got to say. Far too many Americans of all racial backgrounds are subject to the most crippling segregation of all. Theirs is a segregation from opportunity that is inevitable as a result of poverty. If you don't believe it, look at Katrina. Their human rights are being denied. Consider this. As a society, we Americans believe that a hungry child has a human right to be fed. And we believe that every human being has a right to medical care in times of injury or disease. These moral values are part of our understanding of what it should mean to be human in our society. Yet, we must almost always remember the words of Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said this, and then I'll conclude, Professor. Human rights must begin in small places close to home. They are the world of the individual person, where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, and equal dignity without discrimination. Unless, and then she said this, unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. And so I'm going to conclude. I had a lot more to say, but I have respect for my professor. And uh, I'm going to step back, and I'm going to get the rest of my comments in your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I have a role to play, as you all know. Uh, I'd like to explain now the uh, second part of this uh, presentation will involve you. There are four microphones in the auditorium, two on the main floor, two on the platform. If you have questions, just please line up behind the microphone and you will be called. Uh, there, there are two general rules. One is that a question, the best questions are short. And secondly, questions in with a question mark, okay? And that's a statement. Uh, and I will take the prerogative to, of asking the uh, first question or question. Um, one, you mentioned the uh, importance of voting and that every vote ought to be counted. Yet uh, Jesse Jackson, Jr., your colleague in Congress, says that there is no constitutional right to vote. Um, should there be, is there, in fact, a law? And if not, um, what can and ought to be done about it? Uh, secondly, you charged the uh, audience uh, with the obligation and responsibility of leadership. How should they be leading now, or should they be leading now? Can they be leading now? Is there a certain time sometimes in the future when they ought to begin leading? Thank you. First of all, um, I, I'm on Jesse Jackson Jr.'s bill. He's absolutely right. We ought to, there should be a constitutional amendment giving people to right to vote. We don't have that now. There are a lot of people that don't want folk to vote. They don't, want, they don't want them to vote. All you got to do is look at, at, at Ohio. When you have precincts that are predominantly African-American or leading, leading Democratic, and uh, people standing in line for nine and ten hours in the rain, and then they look right across the way in a precinct which is in a Republican-leaning area or a white area, and they look and they say, no lines, there's something wrong with that picture. I think that there have been a lot of mechanisms put in place, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist for this one, to know that there are all kinds of impediments, just as there were impediments placed in the way of folks voting with the poll taxes, with the literacy tests, um, and the other mechanisms that were used to prevent African Americans mainly from voting. I think we have a lot of the same things happening today. And I think that we need to do, we need to really be honest with ourselves. I often tell the story about my daughter who's now 23, about when she was three years old, she would put her hand up to her face and she would get right in front of me and say, Daddy, you can't find me. Well, the fact is, is that Americans and a lot of our leadership 
We know the solutions to the problems. It's right in front of us. But we don't deal with them. And so um, one of the things that Professor Nolan has said to me a little bit earlier, and um, uh, Professor Boyd said to me, it was very interesting, when he said that, you know, I think that there are Democrats and Republicans that don't want folks to vote. And that may be some truth to that, because he was talking about more like incumbents. And I think that there may be some truth to that. But that's why we have to try to preserve this thing called a democracy, because the democracy, like I said, the one key piece of the democracy is the, 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 the ability to vote. And when we lose that, and have the vote counted, of, of course, when we lose that, we might as well throw our democracy out the window. Yes, sir. Should I follow on? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Good evening, Congressman. Good evening. I uh, really appreciate your remarks. Very inspired what you had to say. Thank you for spending the time with us this evening. My name is Terrence Gilchrist. I'm a second year graduate student here at Kennedy School. I'm originally from Ohio, where people were standing, like my cousin, for five or six hours to vote in 2004. I'd like to frame my question in this way. People say that this country is a democracy, and that's a conceptual distortion. We are a federalist republic. And this is not something intellectual for me. Um, this is something very, very personal. And I'm going to break off into, into this real quick story. Not a long story, Professor. That's, I saw him <laughs> getting nervous. <laughs> um, I'm here at the school focused on education policy and nonprofit management, and I do data analysis. But I live in Fort Hill over in Roxbury, one of the nicest places to live right now. But it wasn't like that 10 years ago. And there was something that happened a few nights ago that where I was just recuperating just from a long day here, laying down, there's a commotion outside. Someone had been shot, young black male. They happened to put him in a car, and they dropped right off in front of our house. Where I live is right around the corner from Harvard Medical School and from Beth Israel and from other fabulous, you know, world-renowned medical facilities. They cannot get him over to the hospital quick enough to save his life. He was pronounced dead at 9.50 p.m., I think it was like Tuesday night. And something that I want to really get at is that if we're going to have this third wave of reconstruction in the United States, there are some serious obstacles in our way. And if we're going to do a civil rights movement that's multiracial, multicultural, we really need to galvanize our electorate, particularly with this midterm elections. And I'd like to know, here's my question, Professor, how can we generate the momentum to initiate impeachment proceedings of the Vice President and President of the United States? First of all, that's a great question. <laughs> um, this is my firm belief. I do believe that if, if, if this were Clinton, and I think, I believe if that President Clinton did what has been done by this President, there would already be impeachment proceedings. I, I really believe that. Um, I mean, when we just look at the evidence of sending our young people into harm's way based upon, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt, inaccuracies. But we all know that that's not the case. Everything that we've seen says different. Um, this latest thing with the surveillance, we can't break the law. If you break the law, you'd be in jail before you could spit. You'd be in jail. You agree? Yeah, okay. Um, so it's not going to happen. You know why it's not going to happen? It's not going to happen because everything is controlled by one party. That's why, and you've got to understand, it's kind of hard to shape the debate when you have no say in what's debated. And that's part of the problem. And I think that if there's anything that we can do to excite the electorate, and by the way, we excited the electorate to, uh, pretty nicely uh, in the last presidential election. It's just that they outworked us. They outorganized us. And it's interesting, if you notice, they, did, they weren't worried about Florida. They didn't even talk about Florida. I was saying, boy, we, so there's going to be another battle in Florida. They, were, they concentrated on Ohio. They knew something that some other folks didn't know, but they had started organizing two or three years before the election. 
So I think it's going to be very hard, man. I, the thing that I'm concerned about, first of all, that impeachment is not going to happen. I think that it's going to be very difficult. I think the Democrats will pick up some seats in the House, and I think we got a shot in the Senate, uh, but, but I can tell you I think it's going to be hard. The way districts are constructed, it's almost it's kind of hard for an incumbent to lose. Now, we have some seats that are open seats, um, and, and, and folks are retiring as we speak, and so some doors may be open, but the, uh, the seats that I've seen that have been people where have been retiring, they're not the kind of seats that we would normally be able to pick up. So, but, but that's why you're not going to get impeachment because nobody's going to go along with that. Oh, okay. I thought you were raising your hand. I'm sorry. And then I'll come back down on the floor. Yes, sir. Congressman Cummings, uh, thank you very much for coming. I wanted to tell you that I appreciate your very eloquent and timely remarks, especially those on uh, the civil rights movement and the future of that. Um, you pointed to the students in front of you as, as sort of the, um, the um, torchbearers of this new leadership. And th the question is, um, this civil rights movement includes not only African Americans, but Latino Americans, Asian Americans, gay Americans, many people with different interest groups, many people with different social and economic backgrounds. Um, it's not the same um, movement that we saw 60 years ago. And so the question is, how does one lead these diverse interests, and how does, when you, when you look at these students and say that you hand them the torch in terms of leadership, how does one um, take this, this umbrella under them and, and move forward? Well, the first, I'm so glad you asked, and that, was, that question was asked to me a little bit earlier. First of all, the first thing you start off with is getting your education. I know that sounds simple, but I think it's very important that we have a, a very well-educated group of folk who understand all of what is going on. That's number one. I told the group a little bit earlier, don't, come, don't be so caught up right now as a student in being, um, being on such a social, uh, de dealing with such a strong social agenda, in other words, doing a whole lot of volunteering. I think that's important. But the number one thing is to get an education. Because I've seen too many people who call themselves leaders who are not leading anybody anywhere except down the street. Um, two, I think what you have to do is you've got you've to concentrate on certain priorities. And one of those priorities is, is education. That is, making sure that folk are educated, all folk are educated. And that's why I spend so much time on education. See, the problem that I have at the rate that we're going, when you don't educate people, what's going to happen, and we see it already ha happening, the divide is becoming greater and greater. Um, no matter what the colors of the people are, if they're not getting an education, the only thing that's, that they'll be able to do is park the cars or do things like that. And, and I'm not knocking that. But keep in mind, my, my, my uh, sixth grade teacher told me to be a shoe repairman. And he said that you, there's just no way that you will ever grow up and be a lawyer. You must be out of your mind. Um, but there are so many people who need to, they need to be given those opportunities so that they can be all that God meant for them to be, no matter what color they are. And so I, if I were a student, I'd be, number one, be making sure that I was educated. No, okay, I got you. Are you, are you, are you, are you, are you slowing me down? Is that what you're doing? I, I don't know. I mean, did you, are you, were you pointing to someone? Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll get back to you. Yes, sir. I can't, I mean, don't, I mean, I'm trying to answer the questions, and I, I just, go ahead. Okay, all right, go Take ahead. Take your time. Sir, go ahead. I'll, I'll get back to you. Thank you, uh, Congressman Cummings, and uh, thank you, um, Professor uh, uh, Bowie, for organizing this event and for the organizers of the student group. Um, my name is Tyrone Cass Ross, and I'm a graduate student and researcher at Harvard Divinity School. And I uh, had long questions, but I'm going to really distill them. Um, has to do with a sense of abandonment, first of all, that African Americans have felt and have expressed in recent times by the Democratic Party. Um, you mentioned Katrina as being um, an example of that. But I myself experienced a sense or have a sense of abandonment. In 2002, I was a congressional candidate in the state of New Jersey for the 7th Congressional District. And I have a long history uh, with working with the Democratic Party in New Jersey. Uh, we paid our dues, uh, worked hard, folded chairs, blew up balloons. Uh, and all the other stuff, uh, in addition to really preparing, worked with uh, Governor Florio, uh, got uh, 
uh, Senator Torricelli elected. And so when we really put together a campaign uh, in 2002, um, we felt that we had done all the right things and dotted all the I's and crossed the T's, met with Al from the DLC and with the, the leadership at the DCCC, and, um, and even came up with the 10% that the state uh, party required before the machine got behind us. Mm -hmm. And when they realized that this young African-American man had put together a legitimate team uh, and was serious about representing the 7th District, um, we were told that perhaps we needed to step out because someone, uh, a different type of candidate, stood a better chance of winning. And um, when I really looked at it uh, and stripped it away, uh, I began to realize that perhaps they were simply uh, stating that the uh, candidate that they wanted to back, the Democratic Party, my beloved party, um, the only difference was that he was of Euro, he was Euro, Euro American or white and uh, had perhaps spread a uh, million dollars throughout the party. Okay. Question, what do we did do? You, you, did you drop out? We lost in the primary. Okay. We lost in the primary. Uh -huh. um, and question, the question, is, go ahead. question is how uh, do we, African Americans who have those types of experiences, remain loyal to the party? Mm. How do I, how do I, how do I, how do I um, uh, deal with those wounds and still uh, remain true to a party that I've supported? And this is just the second precise question. How do you remain prophetic? Your name is Elijah. How do you continue yeah. to do what you just did and remain yeah. prophetic given the, the interests of, of money and market that are working against your prophetic is, voice? Uh, Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And it's, uh, I mean, you couldn't have planted a better question um, because I just left a conference where I was a keynote on theology and how do you take theology and then... Uh, in the, into a political world. First of all, I had my own problems with the Democratic Party. Uh, when I ran, I was uh, down by 15 or 20 points. And I had a lot of people discouraging me, but not, not for the same reasons. I come from an African-American, predominantly African-American district, but they felt that there was somebody who could beat me pretty bad. And they said, poor little Elijah, you know, why don't you get out? And um, you, you don't have no money. See, you had money. I, I didn't have any. And they said, uh, you can't, there's no way you can do it. You come from a district that is the worst voting district in the state out of 47. And I beat my opponent by something like 20 points. I think we have to fight within this party. And, we got, and, and we've got to try to make this party honest as we possibly can. Because I keep going back, and I'm going to be short as I can with this answer. I keep going back to what President Bush said when he went to that conference. I think it must have been the Urban League, and said, what to minority folk, black folk, what has your party done for you lately? And I got so mad, and I asked myself, President Bush, what you should be asking is, what, why have you stood in the way of African Americans moving forward? So the party is not perfect. But sometimes I think that in the black caucus has had the same issues that you had. We raise money for the party, and then a lot of times when they're African-American candidates, they're not necessarily ones that seem to get the, the nod. And we got to just keep fighting, because I, I do believe that there, I think there's a, there's a lot of people that have a theory that a third party, another party would be good. But I don't think that that's going to develop enough during my lifetime to happen. So I think we have to try to work within the party, work with us in the Congressional Black Caucus. We'll do our best because we, we go around the entire country helping to elect people. Now, the second part of your question, which is so important. I think what I do is a lot of people don't realize it, but, you know, there are a lot of people who want good government. A lot of them probably gave you your campaign. They just want good government. And so I, I, am, I have a certain level of freedom because I have a district where in Baltimore, if I don't spend one dime on campaigning, I'm going to get 95% of the vote. So that gives me a certain level of freedom. And other candidates, other members who may have a close situation, they don't have that freedom. So for me, it's a little different. And I, and I try to balance, I try to think about my religious beliefs in, in many things, and I catch hell from both sides. When I voted for, for Shibo, I got knocked as being conservative. They said I was on the side of the Republicans, but I voted for Shai Vota having one more shot because I, she was still alive and 
I figured she could they should have a chance to get bread and water. Uh, when I came out and said to the President of the United States, God would not be pleased with the way that people treated the folks in Katrina, Katrina, I got attacked from the right. Preachers attacked me, by the way. So I think that, and one, can I say one last thing about public policy? If there's anything I have learned in my 20-some years of being in elected office is that it is so important to try to be true to yourself. And I know, I know it's so tempting. I am convinced, I am thoroughly convinced that if Kerry had been true to himself, he'd be a president today. I believe if Al Gore had been true to himself, he would have been president today. I believe that. And I believe that voters sense that. They sense it. And they, and, 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 they, and they feel that you are true. And I have had, I'm telling you, I've had, and I'm almost finished, I've had situations where I have gone in to situations in my district where people were out to really do me in. They didn't like my positions. It may be a conservative portion of my district. And when I explained to them why I felt the way I felt, the next thing I know, they were doing fundraisers for me. Because they, people, are, people are in search. This is what this conference is about. People are in search of a higher calling. You know, I don't go around knocking people that vote for President Bush. Uh, I don't knock the, the, the religious right, because there's a reason why people are going there. I think people are in search of something bigger than Democrats and Republicans fighting each other all the time. I believe that. And so I think that what we have to do is reach for our highest good. And that's what's so important for the people in this room. Don't always go around trying to figure out a poll. Be the makers of opinion. You know, so that when they poll, it's your ideas that folks say, oh, yeah, I, like, I don't like that. We too, we're too busy so often trying to, 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 to go along, to get along, that we fail to cultivate the gifts that we have been given. And all of us have a wonderful minds. I was talking to Jewel James, and she was telling me something. I know, I know I'm going over. Um, Jewel James was telling me something just a while ago about how she liked being here because of the students. And what she was saying is that if, when I'm in an environment with brilliant people, what happens is it causes me to think things that I never thought. And so when the thoughts come together, I then go to a higher level of thought. That's what it's all about. And we have to understand that. Yes, sir. Um, my name is uh, Kobe Naidu, and um, I'm a first-year student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm from Ghana. And um, I've lived in the United States for eight years, and one thing that bothers me is that when I listen to um, many black political leaders, uh, when I listen to them and see their actions, I think that maybe we may be pursuing the wrong strategy in the fight for political and economic empowerment and equality. And I say that because... If I think of this as the wall before opportunity, I think that maybe with windows in them, I think maybe we are focusing too much on the walls and not the windows. And I say that because, given the example of the 11 year old you talked about, Hilla, I believe that was her name, um, who yeah. had no, uh, whose library had no books, even as policymakers fight for better books for her, I think it would be better if somebody else will be telling her that, you know, yes, you don't have enough books, but there's still a chance. And these are the things you can do to succeed despite um, having books in your library. And I say that because uh, being an African, when I come here, I see more opportunity than I see obstacle because of the obstacles I had to deal with when I was growing up. And I sort of worry that there may be a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. of us seeing what is wrong with the society, then there's little opportunities. And there's still a lot of fights to, uh, to be fought, but there's some small opportunities that I think we can stop pointing out to people. I think that's a better strategy. Uh, you know what? You, I, I, I agree with you to a large degree. Uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in a school myself which had six rooms and no cafeteria, no, no, we didn't have a library whatsoever. And uh, we, and again, didn't have... Uh, a lot of things that students today have. So I think we have to do, I think we have to do both. I think we have to do what you just said, but can I tell you a little secret? In my district, in my district, you have areas in my district where on, where you may have maybe five computers for say 500 kids. You can go a mile away in my district 
And there's a computer not only on every desk, but computers to take home. See, see, and I guess what I'm trying to say to you is that, yeah, we need to do what you just said, and we, and we do that, but at the same time, we have people in this country who are paying into a tax system. And one of the things that Martin Luther King said is that the most important thing a person can do is demand full rights of their citizenship, that go along with their citizenship. And so what we're saying is that those resources need to be coming back just as they are in other neighborhoods they should be coming back to all neighborhoods, not just to African-American neighborhoods, but to all neighborhoods so that all, we all rise up together. Not so, that the, not, no, not so that the yachts rise, but that we all rise. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for being here tonight. This week, the Democratic leadership hasn't been speaking truth to anybody. They've been focusing on a tragic accident that the vice president was involved in. They've been focusing on a inconsequential, ultimately inconsequential transfer of a, of a port from one foreign company to another foreign company. And I wanted to find out how you were speaking to power within your own party. Because as a Democrat, I sit here and I'm so glad I came tonight because I was inspired again about members like you in our party. And I and I shake my head every time I listen to the leadership. And it's not just about speaking to power George Bush, but it's about speaking to power Nancy Pelosi and speaking, and speaking to the, the power in the Senate. And, and how are you doing that? Well, you know, the interesting thing about the way the power structure is in our party, sadly, we're becoming more and more like the Republicans. So if you have a dissenting voice, for example, uh, you don't always get heard. Hello. Now, Let's talk about Katrina. One of the things that upset me greatly is when my leader, and she knows this, when, we, when, a, when the Republicans set up the special committee to look at Katrina, and the leader did not um, appoint any Democrats, that's crazy. I mean, that's the kind of thing, because Katrina just symbolized so much that's wrong with America. I mean, even if you don't want to, even if you don't care about poor people, just deal with the issue of whether we would be protected if we had a true terrorist attack. I don't think so. So the problem is, is that you can, I mean, there's a lot we talk, and a lot of times I think, and, 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 I, and I beg you to read the book, because and, 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 he quotes so many people from the Harvard School, uh, Wallace's book, um, The Politics of God, I think it is. It's a great book. But he talks about how we've got too many Democrats who are trying to be Republican. It goes back to what I said a moment ago. Where's the wind blowing? How's the wind blowing today? Oh, 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 they say I'm not, I'm not, too, I'm not tough enough on war? So I'm going to suddenly vote for war. Well, I didn't vote for war. As chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, we came on the floor, and Joel will tell you, over and over and over again, and begged. I'm not talking about ask. Begged the president not to go to war. We predicted every single thing, everything. Every single thing that has happened in this war, everything we predicted. And it's worse. And so all I'm saying is, that we, I mean, but let me tell you this, and then, I, I, and then I'll shut up. One of the things that we have to understand is that there must always, even in the Democratic Party, there must be a loyal opposition. And there is a purpose for the loyal opposition. And that purpose is, I'm almost finished. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I really want you to understand this. And I want policymakers to understand this. You may not win every battle. You may not, but you can set the trend. Now you got people running around talking about, oh, oh, I, 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 I voted for the war, but I ain't mean to vote for the war. So suddenly my position becomes popular. And let me tell you something. And we were saying, when the Congressional Black Caucus was standing on the floor of the House saying that we should not go to war, it just wasn't Republicans that said you're not patriotic. How you like that? So what I'm saying to you is that if we are going to have policymakers, they must be policymakers that stand up for what they believe to be right. 
for what they believe to be right. And I know that's hard because you're going to get criticized. You're going to be knocked around. People are going to say you're stupid. They're going to say you're unpatriotic. But you know what? Now, as the time has passed by, what was right is now coming to the surface. But if no, ah, i got to say this. Listen to me. Listen, listen to this. Remember what I said about the loyal opposition? This is how President Bush is. And they just watch. All you got to do is read the Washington Post. President Bush, this is the right. President Bush is all the way over here. He's out there. So then what happens is Democrats are over here. And this is center. So then what President Bush says is, uh, he's over here on the right. He says, tell you what, let's do away with Head Start. I'm, I'm almost finished. Let's do away with Head Start. That's all the way over to the right. And so then what happens is, if you don't have any loyal opposition, he gets that position. Sometimes the positions are so far to the right, I know he don't think he's going to get away with it. But, but, but he's been getting away with it. But then when you have the opposition, what happens is that the opposition goes against him, and they say, and he says, okay, all right, all right, I'll give in. Instead of doing away with the program, I only cut a few billion off. Democrats run around, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. But yet and still, the right position has prevailed. That's why you've got to have a loyal opposition. And the, let me tell you what else happens. When you don't have an opposition, the public begins to say, he must be right. Bush must be right. Democrats like Cummins didn't say anything. And so you've got to keep pushing. I know we're out of town, right? Are we out of town? Two more questions. Can we take two? I know, I know. I, t I promise I'll be quick. I know. Please ask your questions, make them short, and he'll try to respond to all of them together. Thank you. Okay, my question is, is this. Um, probably like some other uh, young African Americans here, um, I was raised in a predominantly white community, um, and one thing that I have felt um, growing up is that there's a divide growing between members of the black community, and how can we continue to build bridges uh, within the black community as um, different groups um, have different levels of opportunities, even within the black community itself. I think that what, I think that what, oh, you want to go, 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 We're going to answer all of them together. Congressman yes, Carlos Broussard, poster, and uh, member of the Western Pennsylvania Black Political Assembly, and I deliberately want to bring the tone down. As a pollster, in the last 13 years, it appears to me that elections are market research driven. And in every one that I have polled, where I have been right and wrong, but generally mostly right, I notice that the technical expertise in the black community is equally virtually non-existent or distrusted in large measure because we are applied mathematicians and statisticians and we are not producing the technical and professional elites to deal with the systematic and methodical management of electability. In this climate, how in heaven's name can you talk about empowerment when we ourselves are not producing the technical and professional elite to at least garner electability. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, related to that question, um, how do we change the mindset within the African American community from being consumers to business owners? Good question. Okay. Where you at? Yes. I think one of the most, um, the biggest obstacles to different racial groups working together is the fact that we all self segregate. And this is very apparent among the, even the ethnic groups on a campus as diverse as Harvard and as educated. So my question is, how do we get past that barrier? And my last question. I wanted to ask about, uh, you focused a lot on education and the opportunities that are available through education. Um, but as much as I can see, a lot of these opportunities are really inconsistent. One year with a great teacher, and then another three years with a really not so great one. You know, summer at summer camp, 
uh, that yields a really wonderful experience and then no real consistency in terms of uh, positive role models um, really within, uh, you know, right next to you in order to help a girl like Kayla make it really from the point of being an 11 year old in the fifth grade all the way through high school and into college. So what can we do to allow for more consistency in terms of positive experiences um, and how can, how can the policies that we make actually be applied consistently? Okay. Is that it? That's it? Okay. You can, thank you. I'm going to be as brief as I can. First of all, I want to go to your, your question. Um, what's the, Joel, what's the brother's name that we use? Uh, friend of Tracy's. It does a poster. Cordell Belcher. Belcher. Uh, the poster that does most of the stuff for, for us in the Congressional Black Caucus and now for the Democratic Party is a fellow named Cornell Belcher. You know Cornell? He's African American. And he has brought a, a tremendous different perspective to the whole, to all this, the issues of African American, not just African Americans, but others, and how they vote. Um, he's one that's been done extensive work on this whole question of moral, what does moral mean to people and that kind of thing. I think that we do have to produce more. And one of the things that, uh, first of all, we've got to produce more. One of the things that the Congressional Black Caucus has done is we have pushed for the ones that may be out there that we use them. Because what we've seen is that we've been losing elections over and over again. And um, we believe that if you've been losing and losing and losing, you need to change who you're using. And so we, we will, we're going to continue to do that. But no, we welcome the opportunity. I mean, I, as a matter of fact, I'd like to get your information. Maybe you can help us out because we, we are always looking for African-American folk who, who uh, are in that area, okay? And we'll do everything in our power to try to also, we push to try to produce them in, in any way that we can. Um, the young lady who asked the question about white and uh, the, about African-Americans and I think what, what is happening is that African Americans are seeing, and a lot of it has to do with poverty and education, but there's becoming a greater and greater divide between the haves and the have-nots. It's not that complicated. I live in, a, I live in a, uh, uh, the inner city of Baltimore. I've lived there for 27, 26 years, and I've, I see it happening. Um, we've got, and it's a mixed income area. And a lot of our kids, sadly, are not getting the education, going back to what one of the brothers said uh, 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 over there. And, I, and we, a lot of them are. The ones that are getting the education, they're, they're like you. They're ending up in places like this. I mean, on the other hand, we have, we have a problem, and some of that problem goes to us taking care of us. In my district, we have, a, sadly, a, drug, a serious drug problem. It's one of the most serious drug problems in the country. Out of 675,000 people, you've got an estimated 65,000 addicts. And that, I cannot begin to tell you how much that breaks down the family. Uh, there was a time when women were, would stick with the kids. Now we're finding that a lot of the young mothers are abandoning the, their kids. It was a time when the grandmothers would then take, take the kids. Well, what's happening now is sadly because there's not that big of an age difference as it used to be between grandmother and mother. Then what we're finding is, in many instances, a lot of our grandmothers are dying early, um, and many of them, sadly, uh, are suffering from the same ailments that the children are suffering from. We see that a lot in Baltimore. We've spent a lot of time on drug treatment and things of that nature, and I think a lot of it has a lot to do with the ailments of society. So, um, the young lady who asked uh, positive experience for black children, is that the young lady? You. Is that, was that you? I think... I think, I think that um, maybe I don't understand your question, but one of the things, let me just tell you one thing that we do in Baltimore. We send, we send kids uh, over to, I do, send about 14 or 15 kids over to uh, Israel and Egypt every year. And these are inner city African American kids who are like in the 10th, 11th grade. We get them a passport, they stay there for four weeks, we pay all their expenses. Let me tell you what happens to these kids. We've done it now for nine years. We used to do it when they were in the 12th grade, and then, then we reduced it, brought it down to 10th. Every one of those kids have been successful. Every one of them were on a path where you just, you, you couldn't see the rainbow. In the, but now, because they were exposed to more. And so there, I told a group a little bit earlier, I think that we all have to cultivate 
our gardens wherever we are. Um, and a lot of people say, I want to help uh, kids, I want to tutor or whatever, but I don't have enough time. And then we end up doing nothing. And so, but I, I know I didn't answer your question, but I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards. Uh, what else do we have? Um, folks going from being um, consumers to, right. Um, what, I think what we've got to do is, first of all, m make people realize, help them realize that they can own. Uh, we got we to gotta even get folk to realize they can own a house. Um, and we in the Congressional Black Caucus have concentrated on that whole wealth creation, trying to get people to begin to think that way. But as I said to the young people a little bit earlier, first we got to get them educated. And, and I told some young people here at Harvard that sometimes I think, you know, we look at the world here at Harvard. Harvard is not, sadly, what we see out in the street. The guys in my neighborhood, you know, if you're talking about a record company, they, 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 they with that. Or you, they, uh, but when you're talking about owning a, uh, a store, for example, that sells Nike shoes or whatever, they, they, it's hard for them to even dream of that. And so I think what we have to do is we need to do bring, bring folk in so that they can begin to see African Americans who are doing well or even mentored by other people other than African Americans. But they got to see it. See, part of the problem is they never see it. One of the things that I constantly tell the mayor in Baltimore about, I say, look, you got to make sure that African Americans in the 65% black city are put into key positions so that, not just so that they can do what they got to do, but so little kids can begin to see it, you know? I became a lawyer because of a black lawyer that I saw. He was the only black lawyer I knew. But I did it because my daughter went into to, to public relations because Kathy Hughes brought her into her office and, and mentored her for a month. And she's been gone ever since. And so I think what we have to do, and these sound like real small little things, but they're major things. And one, one other question, somebody, market research, diverse education, who did I leave out? I left out somebody. Now, your question was, real quick. I think people have a tendency, voluntary segregation. I think people have a tendency to go to the people that they might feel most comfortable with. We see it all the time. And let me tell you how black people are. <laughs> I don't care if they five <laughs> or 105. If a black person see another black person in a room, usually they're gonna gravitate towards that black person. Let me tell you why I think that is. I think it's a level of comfort. Because they, they feel like, I think it sort of automatically says, they say, well, you know, they probably uh, can, I can identify with them, we can have some conversation, whatever. But I think we have to break through that. I think we have to find ways to break through that. Um, because what, what I've said is that too often what we do is we never talk to each other, but we talk about each other. And sometimes if you just begin to talk to each other, you begin to find that you have so much in common, so much in common. And sometimes there are cultural differences or whatever. But I do believe that if we are going to rise, we have to all rise together. We have to use the talents that we have been given. And by the way, as I close, all of us have been given talents. And if you don't remember anything else I say, remember that every one of you, every one of you should be about the business of developing whatever the talent is that you have been given. And you must use that, that talent to touch the world and to make a difference. May God bless, may God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for coming tonight. Good evening.